Welcome, sons and daughters of God. It is a joy for us to be together on this seventh Sunday of Easter. Easter is a week of weeks, a long time of celebrating the good news of the resurrection of Jesus and the new life that is ours in him. So welcome here in this space and also want to offer a word of welcome to those of you who are worshiping with us at home or wherever you may be seeing this. We're delighted to be with you and thank you for spending some time with us in this time of worship. Today we hear Jesus praying for us. Maybe not something that we've thought about before, but Jesus prays for us that we might know how to live our faith out in this world and be witnesses to the good news. So we will hear that good news and be witnesses to it as we worship to get together today. Also today we will be uh, singing This is the Feast together. Uh, it's not something that we do uh, separate, but we do it together as we share in the joy of Easter through the feast of victory that is ours in Jesus. So we invite you to join together with us as we sing. So again, welcome. Let's take a few moments to prepare ourselves for worship. Stand as you are able. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Refreshed by the resurrection life we share in Christ, let us give thanks for the gift of baptism. We thank you, risen Christ for these waters where you make us new, leading us from death to life, from tears to joy. We bless you, risen Christ, that your spirit comes to us in the grace-filled waters of rebirth, like rains to our thirsting earth, like streams that revive our souls, like cups of cool water shared with strangers. Breathe your peace on your church, when we hide in fear. Clothe us with your mercy and forgiveness. Send us companions on our journey as we share your life. 
Make us one, risen Christ. Cleanse our hearts. Shower us with life. To you be given all praise with the Holy Spirit in the glory of God, now and forever. Amen. of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you. And also with you. This is a feast of victory for our God. Alleluia. This is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia. Hallelujah. 
Let us pray together. Gracious and glorious God. The first reading is from the first chapter of Acts. Before he is lifted into heaven, Jesus promises that the missionary work of the disciples will spread out from Jerusalem to all the world, and that the disciples will be accompanied and empowered by the Holy Spirit. His words provide an outline of the book of Acts. A reading from Acts. Luke writes, in the first book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus did and taught from the beginning until the day when he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While staying with them, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father. This, he said, is what you have heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, it is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going and they were gazing toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes were standing by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go to heaven. Word of God, word of life. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. The second reading is from the fifth chapter of 1 John. God has borne witness to the gift of eternal life in Jesus Christ. Whoever believes in the Son of God believes in the witness of God and has the promise of eternal life. A reading from 1 John. If we receive human testimony, the testimony of God is greater, for this is the testimony of God that he has testified to his Son. Those who believe in the Son of God have the testimony in their hearts. Those who do not believe in God have made him a liar by not believing in the testimony that God has given concerning his son. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the son of God 
so that you may know that you have eternal life. Word of God, word of life. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Our gospel verse for today is a new song called Christ Our Peace. I will sing it through once so you can learn it and then you can join me the second time through. Christ our peace You break down the walls that divide us Christ our peace Come make us one body in you Together Christ our peace You break down the walls that divide us The Gospel according to John. Jesus prayed, I have revealed you to the ones you gave me from this world. They were always yours. You gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything I have is a gift from you, for I have passed on to them the message you gave me. They accepted it, and know that I came from you, and they believe you sent me. My prayer is not for the world, but for those you have given me, because they belong to you. All who are mine belong to you, and you have given them to me, so they may bring me glory. Now I am departing from the world. They are staying in the world, but I am coming to you. Holy Father, you have given me your name. Now protect them by the power of your name so that they will be united just as we are. During my time here, I protected them by the power of the name you gave me. I guarded them so that not one was lost except the one headed for destruction as the scriptures foretold. Now I am coming to you. I told them many things while I was with them in this world so they would be filled with my joy. I have given them your word and the world hates them because they do not belong to the world just as I do not belong to the world. I am not asking you to take them out of the world but to keep them safe from the evil one. They do not belong to this world any more than I do. Make them holy by your truth. Teach them your word, which is truth. Just as you sent me into the world, I am sending them into the world. And I give myself as a holy sacrifice for them, so they can be made holy by your truth. This is the gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. In the name of the risen Christ, amen. amen. As I was preparing for today, I began to reflect back on last week's service where we baptized little Luke Brewer. And I was reminded that just as it is with all young children when we baptize them, he is going to grow up with a whole host of options of how to live out his faith, how to live into his faith and, and determine what difference his faith is going to make in his life or whether it's going to matter at all or not. And then later on in the week, I had a really interesting conversation with two of our members who have a neighbor that came to them and shared with them what I would call some very unorthodox views of the faith. 
They wanted to know more about where this kind of thing comes from, whether or not it's a heresy to believe things like that, and how you deal with someone who has those kinds of views. I mean, what do you do with snake handlers? Not that these folks were snake handlers, but it was out there a pretty good ways. And so all of that was, was sort of going through my head, and, and, and I realized, you know, I think we all can agree that there are lots and lots of things we can believe. And let's just, for, just for the sake of this discussion, let's just think about just the Christian part of this. Let's, let's just take the other faith traditions off the table for just a minute. I might say that I'm a Christian, but what kind of Christian? There is a whole smorgasbord to choose from in terms of how we express our Christianity. In fact, you may not realize this, that there are over 30 expressions of Lutheranism in North America. That's just one little strand. And so simply calling ourselves Christian doesn't really describe a whole lot these days. And then you might hear somebody say, well, it doesn't matter. What we really need is that we all just need to have a biblical worldview. Okay. What part of the Bible are you going to use to shape that worldview? The Bible is a big book. It's a story that stretches out over thousands of years, literally. Which part of the Bible are you going to use to make that worldview possible? And the fact of the matter is, we all already have a worldview. We all are willing to bet our life on something. And whether it's biblical or not, we do tend to bring our worldview into the church. And we also want our church to support our worldview. We hope the church will, will support our desires, our plans, our politics, our economics. And to keep pushing this just a little bit further... We hear that we want the church to maybe take a particular stand on an issue or a problem or something going on in the world, and we are glad when they speak this way, but we also know there are folks who feel exactly the opposite. And we all go to the same church. And remember, we haven't even started discussing all those other possible belief systems available out there. Oh, Luke, you have got your work cut out for you, my child. And so do we all. So do we all. We really do need to figure out how we will let our faith shape our life. Because Jesus tells us that's what we're supposed to do. We, today we read two passages that speak directly to this whole subject. The Acts passage takes place when Jesus is getting ready to return to his Father in what we call the Feast of the Ascension. And the passage from John is where we hear Jesus praying for the disciples in the upper room before he is to go out and be arrested and crucified. Now we, we read them out of sequence, but there's a message in both that address this whole thing. We hear Jesus talking about the importance of having us as his partners in the world. In Acts, he says, you will be my witnesses. 
all over the place. We are the ones who are to share the good news that God loves this world so much that God would come to us in the flesh with a message of forgiveness and hope and reconciliation and healing. We are the ones who get to share that message all over the world. We're given the honor and the privilege of offering the world a different view of life, a different set of priorities and, and objectives than what the world has for itself and for us. But Jesus also knows that we have to be careful how we do that. That's why he prayed for us in John. He says he prays that we might be protected from evil and from all the things that draw us away from God. He says, I am sending you into the world you can't be a very good witness if all you do is sit home. I'm going to send you out into the world. But he also says, but we don't belong to the world. And you see, that's where the struggle really comes. Because Jesus gives us this message that is so fresh and so life-giving and so life-affirming that the world hates the sound of that. So what's it like to be in this world but not be of this world? To offer an altogether different vision of what life can be and should be. To be shaped and guided by a different story than the drab old story the world wants to give us. And assuming that we even want to have that vision and be shaped by that story, where do we begin? Well, maybe. Maybe we begin by remembering who we are and whose we are. All throughout the Easter season, we have been celebrating the gift of baptism, just like we did with Luke last week. And so maybe we ought to begin with our baptism. The promise of baptism is exactly what Jesus says this morning. We belong to God. I really like what the old baptism service says or how it, how it expresses this. It says, we are born children of a fallen humanity. We are born into a broken world. A world that pulls us away from God. A world that wants us to live by its desires. Its dreams. But the service goes on to say, in the waters of baptism, we are reborn as children of God, inheritors of eternal life, heirs to a new dream of living, a whole different set of hopes and expectations. And so it starts right here. And I want you to hear that and understand what that means. In fact, I want you to feel that promise. As part of our service of baptism, we, we take water or oil and, and we make the sign of the cross on the baptized and say, call them by name and say they are ch a child of God. So I want you to do the same thing. Everybody's got a finger and everybody's got a forehead. Make the sign of the cross on your forehead. Say your name and say child of God. Bill Milholland, child of God. You are a daughter of God. 
you are a son of God. You are an inheritor of a holy and mysterious and wonderful gift of life that God gives to you. So what would it mean if we could and would begin to live into that reality, into that holiness? What would it do for our living and our witnessing? I really appreciate the way Pastor Janet Hunt approaches this whole thing. She says that all throughout the Gospel of John, Jesus is running around saying, I am, I am, and he, and he uses these different images to express who he is as the image of God in the world. What would it mean for us to hear Jesus inviting us to see those same holy images in ourselves? Because we too are created in the very image of God. So, what might it mean if I were to see God's image of me as being the bread of life? I am the bread of life, Jesus said. What would it be if I saw myself as the bread of life, as, as someone who, who wants to feed the hungry, who looks for opportunities to take meager resources, just like Jesus took the, the, the simple lunch of a, of a child and fed the multitudes. What if I were to take meager resources and share them with the crowds? How might I live differently if I wanted to live in a world where no one, no one goes hungry? Or suppose what we might do if we could see ourselves as the light of the world. Jesus says, I am the light of the world, but he also said, let your light shine. How might our light provide safety and direction and understanding for those wandering around in the darkness? How? How could the blindness that so many have to the reality of God working in the world, how might that blindness be lifted through our light? Jesus said, I am the gate for the sheep. Could we be a point of welcome for those people who need safety? or shelter, or community? Or might we put our energy of being the, the protectors of the vulnerable when we see ourselves as being the good shepherd? You see, there's so many ways that we can see ourselves as the very image of God in the world and live by that image and share it with those around us. Because we are part of God's vast dream for this world. And of course, if that begins in us, then there's no way it's going to stay with us. We can't just see all this stuff in ourselves and not share it, not witness to it. And that comes when we start to see the same kinds of things in others that we see in ourselves. Because you see, they too are created in God's own image. A nurse supervisor at a local emergency department tells about how she would train and counsel new young nurses under her care. The emergency department is such a, a stress-filled place, but the, the medicine that they practice there is vital. But it can be so hectic and so so chaotic that it becomes very easy to forget the value of the people that you're trying to treat. And so what she would do is she would ask them to literally see the people that they are treating as their own grandma. 
or their own grandpa or their parents or their brothers and sisters or some dear loved one. She urged them to train their eyes to literally see their patients differently to catch a glimpse of their holiness and see in them an image of love itself. And she said it made a huge difference in the morale of that department. If we could begin to see others with holy eyes, wouldn't it make a difference in how we look at them and see ourselves in them? And could that possibly be a starting point to end all the division and the suspicion and yes, even the violence that so easily comes between us? I'd certainly like to think so and hope so. My dear friends, there are lots and lots of different ways that we can believe, things that we can believe in, lots of worldviews that we can live by. But today, Jesus invites us to believe and live by our baptismal promise. So make the, cha make the sign of the cross again on your forehead and say, I am a child of God. No matter how your days unfold, that's a pretty good place to start. Remembering your baptism. In Jesus' name.
Will you stand as you're able for the prayers of the people? On this seventh Sunday of Easter, let us pray for all who are in need. Responded to each petition with the words, give us, give us life in your name. For the church we pray, O oh God, that you raise up the next generation of pastors, deacons, and musicians to serve your people, that you protect believers wherever danger threatens, and that you grant Christians a spirit of unity with all who are baptized. Hear us, God, Holy Father. Give us life in your name. For peace and justice, we pray that leaders of nations act with integrity in the decisions, that the poor be respected and supported, that prejudice against people of different color or language or ethnicity be ended, that our government use wisely the tax money it gathers. Hear us, God, righteous ruler. Give us life in your name. For families, we pray, that families under any stress be strengthened, that immigrant families find acceptance in their new home, that people forced to live away from their families be comforted, and that family members increase in forbearance with one another. Hear us, God, bond of blessing. Give us life in your name. For all the sick and suffering we pray, that you give medical care to all COVID, that you visit with compassion the people of India, that you sustain those with lifelong disability, and that you embrace those we name before you. Susan Bayman, Jesse Brock, Betty Burkhart, Shirley Gosfer, Sam Green, Alberta Holden, Paul Letts, Gary Miller, Mary Lou Schofield, Roger Strong, Bill Sutton, Ron Wagner, and for those on our lips, Lord, and in our hearts. Hear us, God, physician and nurse. Give us life in your name. For all graduates, we pray, that opportunities for appropriate employment or further education be open to them. For all who cannot benefit from such schooling, especially for women where their education is forbidden, we pray that you show them a worthy way forward. Hear us, God, teacher of truth. Give us life in your name. For ourselves, we pray that despite sorrow or setbacks, we yield the fruitfulness that you intend from us and that you receive the prayers of our hearts. Hear us, God, source of peace. Give us life in your name. In the joy of resurrection, in the hope for the gift of your spirit, we raise these prayers to you, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. May we greet one another with the sign of Christ's peace. those of you worshiping with us at home, we will be celebrating communion at this time, and we invite you to gather your bread and cup and share in this meal with us. 
We also invite you to commune all who gather in your setting, or you may commune by yourself if you are alone. When the time comes to share the meal, we invite you to commune with these words, with the bread, the body of Christ given for you, and with the cup, the blood of Christ shed for you. Now please stand as you are able as we share this meal together. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is, it is right, right to, to give, give our thanks, thanks and, and praise. praise. It is indeed right to give you our thanks and praise, O God. For you have put your testimony in our hearts so that we might know that our life is in you. You created the earth and the heavens and marked out the way of the upright. Through the prophets you called us to accept life and none are lost to your love and protection except those who turn away to their own ways and reject life. You sent your Son into the world and, he entrusted, and entrusted to him those who accept your word. He made you known to us and pray that we might share the identity you gave him and so be one with each other in your love. Though he was killed, you raised him from the dead. And through your sanctifying word of truth, you call us to share eternal life in him. Therefore, with our hearts lifted high, we offer you thanks and praise at all times, with the church on earth and the church in heaven, and we join their unending hymn. The night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then after supper he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for them to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sins, do this in remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Christ invites us to this table. Come, eat and be satisfied. We will commune the pulpit side first. Please be seated. Given for 
Amen. Amen.
May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. pray. Wellspring of joy, through this meal you have put gladness in our hearts. Satisfy the hunger still around us and send us as joyful witnesses that your love may bring joy to the hearts of all people. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Again, welcome to this time of worship. It is good that we can be in our Father's house It is good that we can share this time together with those of you who are worshiping online with us. It's God's great big world, and it's good we can be together in both places. Thank you for worshiping with us today. Given the uh, announcement a day before yesterday from the CDC and our governor, uh, there is an awful lot of things up in the air about uh, COVID and what that means for us. And so our church council is meeting uh, in just a few minutes for our normal monthly meeting. And I'm sure that there will be a lot of discussion about our protocols moving forward. The pandemic is not over. And so we need to work together to try to make sure we are on the same page for how we approach that. And so that's a very important thing. And we will be sending you information about that just as soon as we get it. But that being said, I would like to take just a moment of personal privilege to say thank you. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for your cooperation. Thank you for your guidance. Thank you for being generous with your time, your talent, your money, in order to make an awful lot of things possible. And I wanna just also say, I'm not sure you're aware of just what, we, what all we have been able to accomplish in spite of the difficulty we've been going through these past months. We've all been through a year that we never thought we would ever have to deal with. But in spite of that, just think of what we have done as a congregation. The generosity, of financial generosity of people who have made it possible that we could buy equipment to broadcast our services literally around the world volunteers who came to make sure that happened, to to be trained to use the equipment and using it well so that we could could do that, to refashion our sanctuary, to have a new control booth where that kind of equipment can be used properly and and well, Uh, the generosity of volunteers who step up and do all kinds of amazing things from, from setting up stuff outside and tearing it down to making sure that places like Murrayville School and Mother Hubbard's Cupboard have, the, have what they need to do their ministry. All of that is something that we have been able to do in spite of the difficulties that we have uh, encountered. That is God at work in us and through us. And so I want to thank you all for that. And I also want to say a special thank you to Mark Hellman and for his coming among us and bringing a a vibrancy and a joy to our worship with with a new worship service that is is, uh, invigorating and lively and for the uh, anticipation that we have for what we're going to be able to do moving forward with our our choirs. He's kept the bell choir uh, going. I mean, it's just amazing what all we have been able to do together. And for that, I want to say thank you. And I think we all need to say thank God. 
So with that being said, I'd like to invite you to stand as you are able because we couldn't do this without God. And we wouldn't be able to have the courage to do it unless we understood and believed that God has always loved us. God loves us now and God will love us forever. That's good news that allows us to do some amazing things together and to go about our life with courage and with joy. So we go from here trusting that God will indeed continue to bless us and keep us, that God's face will shine on us with grace and mercy, and that God will look upon us with favor and give us peace. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah, Christ is risen. Go in peace, share the good news, hallelujah. Thanks be to God, hallelujah.